welcome back to the Photo Justice Photo Moment Show. This is the commentary section. We just had a really fun, long, not super long, but reasonably long, it was, a bit, you know, it was pretty long, discussion about uh, ideal Micro Four Thirds Lumix, obviously, camera kit to buy for under $1,000. Some really great suggestions from the live audience, so if you haven't watched that, go back and watch it, because that was cool. And this is just the commentary section on that, so any question is fair game. For those of you that had questions that came up earlier that uh, that that you that I said, throw it up later. Now is the time to throw that question up. In the meantime, I'm gonna scroll back here and see what I might have missed. Uh, Marvin was asking earlier about the best sports lens, and then he says for video, for sports video, I, th I still think that 100 to 400 would do you. I would, what I would do, because it's a pretty expensive lens, is I would rent it. Give it a try, rent it once, um, see if it does what you need it to do, if it's the right focal length, if it's fast enough for what you need, and see how that works out for you. If not, then you know, look at something else, but I, I, that's what I would do. I would rent it and give it a try. It's a little bit spendy to just go out and buy and then go, oops, wrong choice. Uh, and Simbim is saying, honestly, the best sports lens would be the Olympus 40 to 150 f2.8, especially if your camera has IBIS so it can be stabilized. So you get a 300 millimeter f2.8 equivalent. That sounds like a nice lens. So it's another good option as well. Not as long, right? You're not getting out to the 400, 800 millimeter equivalent. Crazy long, but uh, sounds like it's good to consider. Excellent, thank you very much. Dave Dill Studio says, as I have dual IS on my GH5, when do you use e-stabilization for video in the GH5 menu? That is a fantastic question. I have it disabled. I have found that I prefer the, the look of stabilization without the e-stabilization. It's the electronic stabilization added to the mechanical stabilization almost feels like too much stabilization. I don't want it to be, if I'm hand holding, I want it to look handheld, right? If I want it to look like it's on a tripod, well, I'll put it on a tripod. If I want it to look handheld, but obviously not be shaky, then GH5 with the built-in stabilization, physical, mechanical stabilization, and not the electronic is my preferred way to go. The other thing is when you put on electronic, it has to punch into the shot a little bit, right? Because the way electronic works is physically, the sensor's moving when it's doing physical, but when it's doing electronic, then it's virtually moving the image around to keep it stable which if it just moved it, then you would get black bars showing up on the top and bottom, right? So it has to zoom into the frame a little bit so that it has some wiggle room. So you do end up punching into the frame just a little bit when you're using electronic. For those two reasons, for that and the fact that I think it's almost too stable, I prefer to leave it off. If you had a, let's see, if you had a lens that was not stabilized, okay, so you've got body, in-body stabilization on the GH5, of course, but you have a lens that is not, and you find that it is not quite stable enough, then go ahead and turn it on, then activate it. But for me personally, I find everything on at once, stabilization in the body and the lens and electronic is too much, too much stabilization. So take that for what it's worth, give it a try on your own, but that is my personal recommendation. Oh, uh, let's see here. Marvin bought the GH5 training. Thank you very much for that. I do appreciate it. I know there's a question that I told someone to throw up again later, and I'm not seeing it. Um, let's see here. Maybe that was Kevin's question. I don't remember now. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to scroll back and see if I can find anything, because this is fun. This is fun. I'm having a good time with this. Uh, we talked about the B cameras in there. Linus says, hello, how are you? Well, I'm doing very well, Linus. Thank you for asking. And... I am sure there's another question. Oh, well, maybe not. Okay, so that's that's that. Let's go back to the end and let's see what else is popping up. Uh, where were we? Um, Marvin says, Marvin says, uh, your original topic question is a newbie. I'd also include a monopod. Really? I wouldn't. It's too much like hard work. Carrying around an extra thing you got to set up. and I just, I'm not, I'm not a monopod fan. I, I know some people swear by them. And obviously there are times where you need it but I'm just not a monopad fan. I'd rather just have have the camera without anything attached to it. Um, easier to carry, more versatile. If you're shooting stills, you can go portrait. You can't do this with a monopod unless you got a head on it and then you, you rotate the head. Too much like hard work. I would just rather not, but that's me. If you think that a monopod is necessary and you like working with one, then you should absolutely use it. Um, Jamie Baker says, do images transferred via Wi-Fi from the GH5 to the Panasonic image app result in a loss of quality? No. No, you're transferring the actual file, the JPEG file. You can't transfer raw. You can only transfer the JPEG. If you want to transfer the raw file, then you have to use a, a physical adapter, you know, SD card reader. But no, there's no loss in quality. It's, tra it's transferring the, the actual JPEG file. That's okay. I say that that is my understanding. I have never transferred one, copied one physically and done a difference algorithm on it. That would be the only way to know for sure. But 
in my experience, in my knowledge, my understanding, no, it's just transferring the actual file. It would make less sense for it to actually re-encode the JPEG to make it smaller. That would be that would be bad. So no, I'm sure it's not. I'm sure it's not. Okay, ah, here was the question. Joshua from Carlos Mann had said, do you think it poss it's possible for the GH5 to get a 48p frame rate in a future update? Technically, physically possible, yes. Will it happen? I don't know. Um, but physically, yes, it should, because it can do 24. It can do 48, right? If you put it in VFR mode, if you're shooting 24 and you put it in VFR, you can get 48, but you're not going to get your sound with it. So, um, so there's that. Yeah. So it's technically possible? Absolutely. Is it going to happen? Not a clue. J. Oh, there already asked that. Uh, Zachariah Kazmani says, for macro lenses, how is the Pana like a 45 lens compared to the Pani 30 you mentioned earlier? Oh, that's a good question. Other than longer, the Panasonic one, uh, the, sorry, the 42, 5, 42, 45, 45, sorry, 45 millimeter Leica is a Leica, right? Yeah, it's a Leica lens, so it's a bit sharper. You do gain a little bit there. It is a bit sharper there. I don't remember the aperture comparison offhand. Um, it is obviously a longer lens, so you don't have to get as close to your subjects. If you're shooting things like venomous spiders, you know, <laughs> it could be a good idea. Um, I've used both. I've been very happy with both. I haven't done any kind of side-by-side -side comparison of them, but it is a Leica lens, so your expectation would be to get a little better image quality out of it. That's about all I can tell you. I haven't done a big side-by-side. -side. Uh, let's see here. Simbem says, what Panasonic camera do you think they're announcing in the fall? Even if I, if I knew, I couldn't tell you. Come on. I'm hoping the GX9, all the photocentric features of the GH5, plus dual slots and an updated GX-like body for $1,600. Well, you have that all figured out. Uh, sure. I have no idea, though. So I really don't know. KR7 says, I'm having trouble, uh-oh, getting foreground and background focus in landscapes with the GX85 kit lens. Uh, so any tips? Okay, so if you're... when Okay, here, let's talk about this. This is... This is a big topic, and we probably could do a whole show around this, but if you're shooting landscape or anything and you want a huge range of focus, in focus, right? Usually when we're talking photography, most people want to have shallow depth of field, but when you're doing landscape, usually you want quite the opposite. You want that flower in front of you to be in focus and the mountain in the back to be in focus. So the way that you get the camera to focus on all of that at once is to stop the lens way down, right? So that might be F16, F22, F32, depends on the lens. The problem is that when you do that, you're not using the entire lens, obviously. You're using just the center of the lens. You are absolutely not maximizing the sharpness of that lens. You're going to get a better quality image as you open up. So that's a bit of a drawback, a bit of a bummer. And if you're stopping it all the way down and you're still not getting the extensive depth of field that you need, then that lens just it is not physically capable of giving you that much depth of field at once, given that situation that you're in. Whatever the closest thing is and the farthest thing is that you want all in focus at once, it just ain't happening. Okay, so how do you compensate for that? How do you fix that other than going on buying a different lens? There's a technique called focus stacking. So you can shoot multiple photos. I shoot a photo of the flowers in the front and the, I don't know, the horses in the midground and the mountains in the background, and then blend those together in Photoshop. And that's actually what we're gonna be talking about today with um, an Affinity Photo. We're gonna be doing this demo later on today on focus merging, which is the same thing, focus stacking, the idea of taking multiple photos and stacking them together. Now, typically, when you talk about focus merging, focus stacking, it's usually reserved for macro photography, extreme macro, extreme close-ups of a thing. And you're talking multiple, maybe dozens of slices of an image, all at very, very narrow, shallow depth of field, blended together. That's what you normally think of, but it absolutely can be used for landscape stuff as well. Foreground and focus, midground, background, blend them together. So that would be a good solution. It just requires the camera to be on a tripod, and it requires you to not have a lot of stuff moving around. It's a little harder in landscape because trees are moving in the wind and so on. So you, you, this is probably going to require a fair amount of manual effort to put it all together, but look into it. Experiment with it. That could be a good way to do it. Um, let's see here. Let's go back to the comments here. Mm -hmm. uh, Marvin, there we go, says, I shot some video of my drive, of my driving a Ferrari, you're, dri you're driving a Ferrari experience, aha, fun, and I really needed a pod, five minutes of video, my arm started to shake. Um, okay, that's, I mean, I guess, it depends on, obviously on what you're carrying. If you're carrying a big, huge lens, then you probably want that monopod. Um, but, you know, again, it's all down to the user. It's all up to you. 
personally don't like the monopods, but there you go. Trevor says, do we have a theory as to why you can't transfer raw images using Wi-Fi? Yeah, my theory is that simply cameras, uh, smartphones, haven't been able to do anything with RAW until recently, so there was no point to it. Now with iOS 10, and I'm sure on Android as well, you can now edit RAW files. These things are most powerful enough to do it. Panasonic simply hasn't updated the app to allow that yet. That's my theory. I haven't confirmed that, but I mean, that makes sense, right? Because there's no point in transferring a RAW file if you can't do anything with it, and you used to not be able to. And so there, there you go. That's my, that's my thought process. Uh, Scott says, agree with Marvin. If you're doing video, monopod is a lifesaver unless you want to do serious style calisthenics. Well, there you go. So everybody's got, everybody's got their thoughts on it. Um, Marvin says, what's the best method of extracting a still from video shot at 4K 60 FPS? Uh, open it up in your video editor and just freeze frame out. Remember though, if you're shooting video for the sake of video, you are probably shooting at a 180 degree shutter, which means every frame is gonna have a little bit of motion blur because that makes the video look better, look smoother, look prettier. If you are shooting video for the purpose of extracting a still from it, either manually shoot at a much higher shutter speed, narrow shutter angle, or, or shoot in 4K or 6K photo mode, which is essentially video with the explicit purpose of extracting a still image from it. So automatically it defaults to that higher shutter speed to get you that sharper image. Very important thing to consider. Uh, if, you just re if you're just shooting video in full on video mode and you want to extract a frame, if there's any movement in there, you're likely to get motion blur in there because that's by design. You want that little bit of motion blur in video, it tends to make the video look smoother. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Josh was confirming, yeah, if you want to transfer raw without a physical connection, then use the in-camera Wi-Fi connection. For what? You can't, no, wait, hold on. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no way to transfer a raw file from the G, any of the GH, any of the Lumix cameras to your phone wirelessly. If there is, let me know. I would love to know that. But as far as I know, there is not. Only the JPEG. But tell me. Joshua, please clarify. Bernardo Silva says, what do you think about the IQ image quality between the G85 and the GX85? Should be virtually identical because they are the same sensor. Uh, as far as I know, all the same electronics. And then obviously the lens is whatever lens you put on there. So they should be the same. Dave Dell Studio says, do you have a GH5 color profile you prefer for shooting video if you're not grading in post? Uh, it depends on what I'm shooting. Uh, I will shoot in vivid if I've got something really bright, poppy, colorful. I have designed my own kind of slightly flatter, muted profile that I like that's, uh, um, I don't know, I just like it. And, or just shoot in natural. Natural though, it's, it's really, if you're gonna do a little bit of basic grading, natural is a good place to go. I really like vivid. I, it's, it's high contrast and high color, so it's a bit much for a lot of things, but I like it. And then, uh, and like I said, I've designed my own that's a little bit more undersaturated. Which, by the way, my custom settings, sorry, I don't know why this thing's pulling on me today. Uh, my custom settings profile will be available for download soon. That's going to be part of the GH5 training, but that's going to be accessible even to non-owners of the video class. So I need to actually get that up there this week so that it's ready by the time that video hits. When it says, go here to download, it's actually there. So that's going to go up soon. And that will include my color profile. Um, Joshua saying, yeah, sorry, not to a phone, just to a computer for transferring the raw file. Yeah, okay, there we go. Stuart Schaefer says, purchased Affinity for iPad Pro 9.7 the other day. Excellent, have enjoyed using it. Excellent. Issue is editing raw. Only way I found so far was using iCloud Drive, unable to import raw from photos via the iPad. Make sure that you have updated to the latest version of Affinity because that was a bug that was fixed. It's been a few weeks though. So if you just purchased it, that should be there. Um, that's interesting. When did you install it, Stuart? Because that was fixed a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, it had to be at least a couple, maybe it's only a week, but I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Bernardo says, uh, what's the difference in DR, dynamic range, between the G85 and the GH5? Oh, GH, that, I, no, I don't know offhand. Um, it's, I mean, the GH5 is the Mac Daddy, right? So it, that's going to be your best, best quality, best dynamic range, but I don't know. Uh, and I don't know if that's even published by Panasonic. That might be like a DxO Labs kind of thing. You got to look at the DxO Mark score and see what they have. I don't know if they've even tested the GH5. I'm sure they have. Simbem says, have you ever noticed that sometimes photos shot look brighter on the LCD than when you bring them into PP, post-production, I'm going to guess? What could be the cause? Um, oh, that's easy. So when you're shooting, whatever you're looking at on the camera here is the built-in JPEG, the embedded JPEG, right? When you bring that camera into Photoshop, uh, Lightroom, Camera Raw, Infinity, whatever, you're starting with the raw file. I'm assuming you're shooting raw here. You're starting with the raw file, which means the look that comes out is going to be completely different than what was in the camera, 
Right now you can't because the, the software has to do the raw decoding, it has to do its translating, it gives you what it thinks you want to see. This is why if you take a same raw file and you open it in five different raw decoders, they will all look different. The way I always explain this is think of it like ingredients and a chef. The, the raw file is the ingredients. I can give the same handful of raw ingredients to five different chefs and tell them to cook the same thing and we're gonna get five different things, right? They're going, it's gonna be the same thing. It's gonna be an omelet or a souffle or whatever, but it's gonna taste a little bit different. It's gonna look a little bit different because every raw, every chef has their own way of handling that. Same thing with the raw file. Every decoder, whether you're talking about Adobe's raw engine, Apple's raw engine, Affinity's raw engine, Capture One's raw engine, they're different. They are different and so they will look different. So from there, you just have to adjust and tweak the file to get it the way you want. If you're talking about JPEGs, if you're just shooting JPEG, then it should look the same in camera as it does in the computer. However, you have to consider brightness and screen calibration, right? This screen that's on here, if you've got the brightness turned way up here and it turned it way down on your computer, then this might look brighter. So that's something to consider as well. Okay. <sighs> Uh, says I found that I have to raise exposure plus one to get the same look you saw in the LCD. So there you go. Um, shoot via, shoot using the histogram, not using your eye. Don't look at the image to gauge exposure. Look at the histogram. Always. It's the only way to truly know. And then if you find that you're consistently over gauging it, over guessing, then turn the brightness down on your LCD. You might just have it cranked up so high that you're fooling yourself into thinking the image is brighter than it really is. This is why, you know, you buy these new iMacs, MacBook Pros, whatever, and they've got these insanely bright screens. If you're doing photo editing, you got to take the brightness down. You're fooling yourself into making, making you think the image is brighter than it actually is because there's so much light coming out of that screen. This is why the histogram matters so, so much, so much. Uh, J Diggity D says, what did you use before you used Panasonic? I was shooting Canon. It's all sitting upstairs in shelves collecting dust. I occasionally use them for props. And uh, Stuart's confirming you installed it just the past weekend. Well, that is very odd indeed. Just make sure that it is actually the latest version and up to date. You should be able to import raw files and try a couple different raw files. Maybe there's a raw format that it's choking on, but Affinity should be importing raw files from the camera roll now. That's the way it's supposed to work. And like I said, they fixed it. Curtis says, did you make the comparison between the SD cards? No, I did not yet do that. I need to buy them. I'm gonna have to spend several hundred dollars to buy all these cards because B&H, um, understandably, won't loan SD cards. And that's just not something I've gotten around to yet. Um, but I will. It's just, it's, you know, that's, that's gonna be an expensive show to do. So, uh, but I will do that eventually. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up there. I don't know about you. But I'm exhausted. I got work to do. Take care of yourselves, everybody. Have yourselves a lovely, lovely uh, rest of the week, rest of the day, rest of the everything else. Do not forget that we are going to Mexico and you should be coming with me. Photojoseph.com slash workshops to Oaxaca, Mexico this October. This is a wonderful, 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 wonderful thing to do, place to go. It's going to be a lot of fun. You should totally come with me because <laughs> we're going to have a blast. We're going to eat some good food, take some good pictures, drink a little mezcal. It's going to be a good trip. Come with me. Join me. Check it out. PhotoJoseph.com slash workshops. You can see a video of the last one. Sign up for this one. And off you go. All right, guys. I'm out of here. Take care of yourselves. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.